أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما دراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله مولانا العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم مولاي صل وسلم دائما ابدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم محمد سيد الكونين والثقلين والفريقين من عرب ومن عجم منزه عن شريك في محاسنه فجوهر الحسن فيه غير منقسم فانسب إلى ذاته ما شئت من شرف وانسب إلى قدره ما شئت من عظام مولاي صلي وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم Dear audience today we have a very lively and interesting topic and I'm sure we will have a good number of participation Alhamdulillah the confirmations are good we don't have only our PF members, but we have also uh, a good number of guests today. So I hope we will have a good uh, session today. Our both presenters have a wide range of experience. Their professional knowledge and working experience is in the range of 20 to 30 years. They are in the field of uh, finance, strategy, IT leadership, quality management and project management. So without wasting any minute more, I would hand over my uh, mic to the, the first presenter, Mr. Mirza Bey. He is the one who is uh, having uh, leadership of this is uh, Fidusium Consulting Services. So, Mr. Mirza Saab, please. Mr. Lal, this is Mirza Bahmood. I am managing part of Fiducium Consulting. Fiducium uh, uh, just a bit of introduction on Fiducium. It's a little over a year old. Uh, we are a broad based consultancy firm. Uh, we do transaction advisory, PS aspects, transaction advisory, due diligences, uh, finance, finance optimizations, finance strategy, balance scorecards. Uh, we work, work with Click as well. Uh, and, you know, uh, we, have, we also have a specialized HR team. We already have now a joint software with STC on the HR side. Uh, we are rolling out an HR program uh, in the next, next couple of months, but we have a good start with STC. This is a 90 module software with uh, STC uh, on their own cloud. And then we have we are into outsourcing as well. We are doing some accounting outsourcing. Uh, we are uh, we are trying to have IT audit outsourced. Uh, we have specialists in that area. Uh, we, we are now we are like over 10 uh, senior people in this firm. In transformation uh, projects, we have been into web implementation and into IFRS implementation. Uh, these two areas happen to be very, very active for understandable reasons. Um, so, 
I will just take you through, you know, what WAD is. A WAD fiduciary is very active. Uh, we have uh, ongoing transformation, 20 plus transformations now, uh, implementations now, and uh, Alhamdulillah, we believe we are doing very well. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I'll, what I'll do is, I'll just, sorry. I understand this is, uh, I mean, senior accountants here, uh, I don't need to, uh, you know, tell you about what WAT is, but yes, I would touch upon uh, some of the important aspects of what a WAT implementation is, and then I'd like to go into more, you know, a hardcore issues that we're facing with VAT implementations in this country. Uh, so, just to start, I mean, I don't think I want to touch upon the definition of the VAT, but what I'd like to touch upon is, uh, what is a VAT implementation and what is, you know, what are the important and critical aspects of a VAT implementation considering the timing right now. So, generally speaking, you know, we know that we collect, I mean, any entity collects VAT on its sales and this is a collection on behalf of the tax department and then you pay VAT on all your procurements, expenses, uh, on almost everything. You know, the, the the VAT law in Saudi, the way it is introduced, unless you are exempted or zero rated, you are part of the VAT regime. Or, you know, if, I mean, the other way of being excluded from the VAT regime is you are not part of the economic activity. So, simply speaking, uh, barring like 8 to 10 items, everything is taxable. So, if you talk about an organization, your complete PNL is, is likely to be, you know, uh, to be taxable and you would have paid VAT into tax on all of your transactions. So, what is critical, you know, I mean, first of all, uh, generally speaking, you know, you have to get your systems ready. Uh, this is the most part, important part of the, uh, of the VAT implementation. Uh, you have to make sure that you're getting your VAT return report on the click of a button, because uh, 40 plus million entities have to be reporting on a monthly basis. And, Considering it's a monthly basis, uh, every month it's, it's difficult for uh, any sizable organization to produce a VAT return or, or manually. And anyways, I mean, they, they, it doesn't seem there's a, lot, there's a provision for a manual VAT return, uh, the way they have set it up. So, if you look at the second, the column second, you know, uh, uh, we can see, yes, okay. okay. If you look at the column second, 25 rials have been collected by this entity on its sales, and this is the output tax that is collected on behalf of the government, our tax department, and it is to be paid to the tax department. And if you come a couple of lines below, there is 10 rials that has been paid by this entity as input tax, and this input tax comes from across the business. It could be on your procurements. It could be on your expenses, your back office expenses, uh, your electricity, your office rent, almost everything. It will come from very strange places. Uh, it, could be, it, it could be on your banking lines, with the commission paid, uh, line management fees, I mean, uh, with, uh, your uh, maintenance fees, all of these fees, the fee-based incomes of the banks are also taxable. So, the, there is an opportunity you have uh, to be, if you're efficient enough, you can recover all of this input tax that you paid them real here in the second column, uh, fourth row. You can deduct this from uh, the tax department's money, 25 real, which you have, uh, and you can just pay the differential 15 real to the tax department. But this is if you're very efficient. The problem is that organizations in Saudi actually aren't that efficient. So, now, our experience with our clients is actually worse than we thought. Uh, sometimes ranging from 25 to 50% of the PNL, as is, is not, input tax is not recovered because of the business structure. So, these numbers may look, appear high to you, but there are lots of contracting businesses which operate largely through petty cash. And 
for I mean, these particular extra invoices come from all over the place, or from smaller regions, sometimes on plain paper, uh, handwritten invoices. So you have all sorts of invoices that currently we have in our system in South. So for you to be able to claim input tax, uh, you have to have a proper invoice, and the format of the invoice is out there right now. You have to have the name of the customer, proper name of the customer on the invoice, proper full name of the customer, and then the address uh, for you to be able to claim input tax. It is unlikely uh, that in a in petty cash transactions you will have this. Then there are other issues. Uh, so, like for in your in your uh, HR, for example, you would have uh, structures currently like people. I mean, we, we see uh, many organizations allowing their employees to go to the hotels, Booking.com, book a hotel. Uh, then you can go and book your own flight and claim a reimbursement. And there are lots of expenses that are reimbursable, where people, where the employees are getting the invoices in their own name. Again, with this structure, you will not be able to get an invoice in your organization's name. Uh, the proper invoice will not be forthcoming, and then you will, you will not be able to claim it for tax. So, again, there is an opportunity here. If you are very well organized, um, then if you are very well organized, then you can claim all of these 10 riyals, and it could be 10 million or 100 million or whatever, depending upon the size of your organization. You can recover all this money from the tax department's money. You already have the money as part of your return. You will just deduct this money and pay the differential to that. Uh, this is a normal organization, where, which is a taxable organization. So, the, the importance is first of all get your system ready and then be efficient from a tax perspective, and make sure every piece of every uh, your penny that you are paid in input tax, you are able to recover it. So you will not be able to recover it unless you organize yourself. This is the message, uh, broadly speaking. Now, uh, these are you know this is a broad, uh, broad uh, description of you know a couple of critical aspects of uh, VAT implementation. I'll go into more detail. Do I need to go through uh, what exempt and zero rate uh, are and what the difference is? Yes. Okay. So this organization, the second volume, this is a taxable organization. You know, so, so the output that uh, the, the, the product that it sells is a taxable product. So it collects tax at 5% uh, uh, on, on, the, on the sales, and then it pays uh, input tax on several, several of its, uh, its expenses, most of its expenses in fact. But another organization could be zero rated. In a zero rate, zero rate category, we call it a taxable category, but the rate of tax is zero, zero percent. So, in a zero rated environment, you are able to claim this 10 real input as a refund because your tax paid will be not 25 but zero because you have zero rate. And this 10 real you will claim as a refund from the tax department. How, whether you will get the refund easily or you know, I mean, that's another matter because uh, in all likelihood that this refund is going to be getting stuck with the government for a long time, but uh, at least you have an opportunity to refund this. Similarly, if you are, uh, are, uh, are an entity that is into <coughs> exempt products, you would lose this input tax. This will go into your p &O because you 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 are an, you have you are an exempt. Your products are exempt, so you cannot claim the input tax from the tax department. So all your input tax goes into your it's your p &O and it's it's cost of your business. But uh, I mean, there are not a lot of exempt goods here. There are not even a lot of zero-rated goods unless you're an export entity or you're into uh, healthcare where, I mean, your supplies, your medical supplies, your med the, the pharmacy sales are, are zero-rated. Even in hospitals, the consultancy is taxable. So there's not, not a lot of, a lot of uh, businesses that have zero-rate or exempt products. So I'll just move on to, you know, uh, We can go through the law, legal requirements, but to, I mean, to considering you are qualified accountants, uh, I don't think there is a uh, there, there is a point in spending a lot of time with the, with the requirements. I'm sure you know uh, you know most of them, uh, unless you tell me to just go through a brush upon a few a few of them. 
Have, I mean, generally speaking, have you been following the law? Uh, how, how many of you have had an opportunity to go through the law? The regulations, I mean. That's not very encouraging. We are back in sentence and we are seeing worse things. It is, you know, it's all fine. Okay, so, look, I already explained that almost everything is, is taxable. So, uh, uh, if you talk about exempt, you know, your domestic leasing is exempt, uh, your financial charge, charge on the loans is exempt, uh, zero-rated perspective medical supplies are zero-rated medical uh, equipments. Uh, 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 you, uh, I mean, if they are in a schedule, and this schedule is yet to be announced, they are uh, also zero rated. Uh, the phase of gold, platinum, uh, some less precious metal is zero rated. So, not a lot of point going, going through that, uh, but if, if, if we want to touch upon a certain, uh, a certain legal provisions, uh, look, this is an EU model that they're following here. Uh, that means that this is, I mean, because Europe is a multi-regional model, this also is a multi-regional model. There have been several countries in GCC. Uh, Asia model has one specific uh, specific treatment, which we call the reverse charge treatment within EU. That treatment is also here, and that is for uh, if you are uh, if you are importing goods from within GCC. Then there's a reverse charge treatment where you don't pay tax, but you just book the output tax and the input tax uh, in the parallel. Output tax debit, input tax credit, at the time when the goods cross the border, the issue border. And also reverse charge is used on uh, services that you receive from across the border. Not from the within GCC, but from internationally. So this reverse charge treatment is there in issue and it is there because of the issue model. Uh, imports. Imports are uh, definitely international imports, they are ratable. Uh, there is a strong implication here because in case of import, you are paying the tax at the border. So there is a cash flow implication for you. Uh, you're, you're, you know, because you will pay this extra 5% on imports at the port, you, you will have certain more of your money getting stuck. There is an opportunity in the law, uh, you can apply for paying the, you know, the, the, the tax on imports as part of your return. The application has to be filed with the tax department. But if you can, you can make a case with them, and if they approve, then you can avoid this additional cash flow uh, implication. Uh, into GCC supplies, I already mentioned, uh, into GCC supplies, you have to treat this to reverse charge method on into GCC imports. So if you're importing from, say, UAE, when the goods cross the border, you don't pay tax at the border. You just record a book entry in your books, which is called the reverse charge uh, treatment. Simply the tax on that import, you debit the tax and the output tax and credit the input tax. That's it. So, uh, I mean, uh, this is what reverse charge is. Very strong deemed supply powers. This is an important aspect of the tax law, and deemed supply powers are everywhere in the world. And this is one area where some of the organizations who are even trying to organize themselves are probably, you know, not uh, preparing for this well. Why? Because beam supply provisions, what, is, what are the beam supply provisions? Beam supply provisions are powers of the tax officer where he can deem a supply as a supply and he can deem the supply at a price that he feels is the right price. So this is a very strong power. So you could be actually transferring goods within a business where which you may feel are let's say for not for economic purposes are, are just a transfer of goods from one place to the other within the business. Say within another, to, to another warehouse and you didn't document it. So the tax department the tax people have power to treat this as a supply and tax it. And they can very well ask you to pay the tax on this. Similarly, a beam supply, a beam supply uh, powers also come into effect in a way that you might be offering discounts. So, if you're, you you have several prices and you are paying, uh, you're, you're selling at a text price to say retail, another price to wholesalers, another price to some companies of your shareholders. Uh, so you might have three, four different prices. The tax department has the power to treat 
any of your supplies at the highest price unless you have a very good justification. So how do you justify several prices? Do, you, or do most of the businesses have strong pricing policies here in the kingdom? Many of them don't even have pricing policies. Pricing policies is a uh, pricing policies. Sorry, pricing policy is something that covers you uh, through the rationales for different prices against the deemed supply risk, deemed supply the risk of the powers of them. So, on the other hand, uh, we take a lot of discount decisions and we never document them. So, for example, you have a market situation, and this the market situation for the last couple of years now. The inventories are not moving. The business waits for three months, sales don't come, then they are forced to give heavy discounts on the products. Now these discounts, uh, they're fine, but the issue is we don't document any decisions. So once you're done documenting any decisions, a couple of years down the line there will be an audit, and you will say, well, all of a sudden you sold X amount of goods at 40% discount. Uh, why did you do that? This may be Connections with certain related parties. This may be just a way of for you of underpricing this. They actually ask their own questions. So, unless you have a decision that documented this and documented clearly uh, that you know why, I mean, what were the market conditions, what the inventory, uh, what, what were the inventory pileups like, uh, what were the competitors doing, what was the business situation like, and you just, if you just have a one page decision, this helps you. Uh, dealing with the tax department. You just get this paper out from your file if you have it, and you're, you're a lot better placed to deal with the uh, deemed supply powers. Discounts, uh, by the law, uh, are allowed for a tax credit, uh, the current law. But the risk is not, you know, uh, I mean, the risk is the deemed supply powers, and, and those can very well be used. Okay. So, uh, I'll just go to the option. This is the option of group registration. Yeah. Uh, contracts. Contracts. Uh, this was a big problem actually before, before they specified uh, in the law that contracts before 31st May will be zero rated. So, what is the issue with the contracts? Uh, you, any entity who's selling is under the tax law a withholding agent. It has a responsibility to withhold the tax from its customers and pay to the department. So this is how the law is. You are the withholding agent as a seller. But to deduct this tax from the customer, you have to have a provision in the contract. Because just because the tax law is there doesn't mean you can deduct the tax from, uh, from the customer. So a lot of these entities, uh, a lot of the businesses here don't have any provisions uh, in, the, in, the law, in, the, in their contracts to recover the tax from uh, the customer. So, if the contracts have been signed before 31st May, there is no problem, it's zero rated, these contracts. But if a contract has been uh, signed after 1st June and between 31st December, and it doesn't have provisions for the recovery of the tax from the, from the, your customer, you have a problem. So again, uh, I'll, I'll, I mean, how to deal with that, we will touch upon that uh, you know, in the part of the presentation. Okay, supplies without consideration. Uh, lots of uh, entities are reliant upon free goods as promotions. One for two free, two for five, three free. Uh, this one, I mean, now, if you are giving out these kind of promotions, you must pay tax on the free goods. Even if they, you're giving them at zero invoice, you must pay the tax on those. So this is a, I mean, this is a, you know, a provision that now enforces uh, forces you to either change your pricing, uh, your promotional policy, and move to a discount system, or you start collecting tax on part of the supplies that are zero rated. So, uh, if you're selling two for three free, uh, two free for three, then you have to collect tax on five of them. Uh, it can be very well, very well be done. Uh, globally, this happens, but the issue is dealing with your customers. It's not easy. Uh, explaining to them, explaining to them the law, and you know, so again, I'll, I'll touch upon this uh, a little bit later. Okay. Blocked inputs, uh, again, uh, there's a personal versus uh, business issue in, in the law, I mean, in general, everywhere in the world. So if you are, if you are, uh, you have a vehicle with an employee, for example, 
and this vehicle is used for personal as well as business. So this employee is taking this car home. You are not allowed to claim income tax uh, on on uh, on this vehicle. So filing 30 plus million, you have to file every month. I refund again. Uh, I mean there are. I explain the zero rated qualified medicines, uh, qualified metal, financial services. <coughs> transportation, international transportation is zero rated. Uh, this creates a big problem. Uh, anybody from you, uh, uh, anybody out of you from the airline business? No, airline? No, travel. Travel. Okay. You are into transportation. Anybody into international transportation? <coughs> Because it's a big problem for airlines now. You can be zero rated for international uh, transportation, but you have to designate your uh, transportation assets as, in, for, as being used for international transportation. So you have to split your, uh, say, planes portfolio into what, which one will be used for domestic, which one will be used for international, split the inventories as well, uh, domestic separate, international separate, so it's a big problem. But I don't want to touch upon this. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll just come to, you know, uh, broader issues relating to implementation. First of all, our roles as finance managers, your roles as finance managers. We started bad implementations as early as April for some of the clients. So there were clients in April who realized that this is a big project, it's a very important project. And they started work on that. And when, once we uh, touched the Ramadan period, we thought people have gotten late, a lot of them. So we are now eight, eight uh, uh, weeks and seven weeks, in fact, from the VAT implementation period. And uh, my estimate is around 70%, 75% of the organizations, and good ones, have not even started on the VAT implementation. Uh, so, when we had six months left, we thought this is time enough for, it will be time for a VAT implementation. Now talk about eight weeks time, seven weeks time in fact, and how do you get ready for VAT implementation? This eight months, in this eight months, you may need to make sure your systems are ready. We have Mr. Ashraf here, uh, you know, IT background. Uh, generally speaking, any ERP, uh, they will tell you they need 30 to 40 man days work for standard configurations in the systems. SAP, Oracle, and it probably could be worse with some of the other systems. Upon that, uh, all of these vendors are very busy. In, in some of them, you, you might even struggle to get an appointment because they are already dealing with 10, 12, 15 guys, but everybody has chosen to do a VAT implementation in the last uh, 8 or 12 weeks. So it, it's, it's a problem we have. So how do you approach this? As a, as a finance manager, first of all, I think we have been making mistakes as finance managers. Uh, we should have pushed for budgets around 6 months back. And we should have pushed for implementation when it started. But getting budgets has been an issue for most finance managers. Getting the right budgets, getting the right support from the stakeholders, Letting, getting the right understanding of the projects itself, you know. Uh, when we start, as solution, when we start with, uh, with our bad implementation projects, we realize that the understanding of a bad implementation project is, this is a finance and ID project, which it isn't. So, I think first couple of weeks on every project, and this is good time, because we don't have a lot of weeks now, we, we, we would be impressing on the management to make sure that uh, the CEO is bought into the project. The stakeholders are also bought into the project. They understand this is their project. Because IT and finance in all likelihood are going to be probably the leaders, but a lot of work has to be done uh, by uh, other departments. I will just explain you know, this in more detail, but I just want to touch upon the responsibility of the finance manager. So, if you are right now trying to do it yourself, internally you are trying to while the VAT limitation, you have to make sure you understand the time limitation. If you don't give 30 band days to your, IT, uh, your ERP vendor, you are going to not 
uh, succeed anyways. So, if you're doing internally or, or even if you're doing through a consultant, you cannot afford to take more than two to three weeks with your systems related inputs because of the time limitations we have here. But normally speaking, any consultant, you know, they do it in three phases. The minimum three phases, an impact assessment, then uh, the solution development, uh, delivery and implementation, and uh, after the system ha uh, systems have, have been gotten ready, then uh, you, know, you do the output testing. So in all likelihood, when you're trying to avoid a consultant now, uh, he will he will tell you I will do the impact assessment in say on a fast track basis in four to five weeks. Four to five weeks and you don't see you have not seen the solution. This is whether you do internally or you do you know externally through a consultant. Because internally as well, you must do the impact assessment. So how do you handle this now? You have to somehow find a way of fast tracking the inputs required for the system. Uh, if you're working with a consultant, you have to ask him uh, his approach and agree an approach with him where he gives you the system inputs as early as two to three weeks. Three weeks max, two weeks, very good if you can do it. So then you have your ERP vendor, he can work, say he can have four weeks, probably 25 man days, 20 to 25 man days, and he can then get, try to get the system ready and then you can do output testing uh, on the system. And if you want to get bugs in the output testing, then you have to go the whole cycle again. So responsibilities of the finance managers, you know, I mean, the times of getting budgets and get appointing consultants or, you know, getting uh, new resources, that's one. Now, uh, you know, again, it's important to take responsibility very carefully. Uh, look, budget is not entirely the CFO's problem. Unless you get a, the strong support from the management, you will not get a budget. This is what will happen. People don't understand that they need to spend uh, $100,000, probably more, uh, on, on a VAT implementation. So uh, right now, uh, I know several of the finance managers who have just delayed this process because of the lack of availability of the budget. And they don't have, uh, they, they, don't, they can, cannot acquire more resources, they cannot get consultants. This is what's been happening. Again, it is important to communicate strongly with the management even now. And right now, how you give yourself, uh, your organization, the best chance to ensure an, an implementation? Uh, you have to start AS, ASAP, and then again, you have to see if you can get, deliver a, again a solution delivered. Uh, so, how do you deliver a solution? That also uh, has to do with certain parts of the impact assessment being fast track. Because especially in contracting businesses, some of the other businesses, you have certain impact assessments, uh, you know, elements that will have an impact on the system. So if you're going to deliver in two to three weeks, you have to fast track those parts and uh, complete the remaining part of the impact assessment uh, later on. Uh, so if you're going to work with a consultant, ask him to fast track this part, and he can work, he can, uh, you know, he can spend more time on the business and commercial aspects of the impact assessment. He can take four to five weeks with that, but he has to fast track this part and give the input to the, uh, uh, you know, to the IT vendor so that he can finish his work and, you know, you, you go that way. So, appointing a consultant, you have to be very careful in understanding the approach of the consultant. All of you are qualified accountants uh, with, with strong experience background, ability to understand the law itself. Uh, unless you have a consultant who is you know, uh, seriously above you, it's not going to help you. And you, know, you can find all sorts of consultants now, uh, right now, if you, if you look at the market. So again, your success of the project will be dependent largely upon your, your work, your team's work. Uh, I will just go through how a project rolls out, an implementation project, and that would probably explain what I'm, what I'm talking about here. But it is the, the, the most important thing is your own input, your own resources, their quality, their hard work. And yes, the guidance, if you can get external, that's great. 
or you can, if you can get down to read the law yourself, again, that can work as well. But the quality of your uh, uh, implementation will be driven largely by your own team. So, again, seven, uh, seven weeks left, how do you approach our VAT implementation projects now? You, once we start a VAT implementation project, we end up with, uh, with, with five, four to five sub-projects across the business. This is the usual way we approach the project. What do I mean by that? So, if I'm going to start uh, a project, say, tomorrow, and this could be you doing the same project internally. It is no different from me doing as a consultant than you doing this internally. So, once you start a project, you are now posi positioning yourself to finish the system inputs in as early as two to three weeks. So, you have to then start working on the impact assessment and fast track certain elements to make sure to you give the inputs to the system in two weeks. In the parallel, there are lots of very important communication projects. Communication with suppliers. People think, I mean, we have seen people just, uh, I mean, many companies are just ignorant of the fact that this is a huge problem. In fact, in my team, I have people who have seen this happen, like Robin Rice, who is part of the Australian transformation, Myself, uh, I've been a tax officer for a couple of years. The biggest problem that uh, uh, you know you face in implementation is people at the door. Before first January, you have people at the door. These are your suppliers. These are your customers. They want to meet you. They don't know what is happening. And this could be 500, 200, depending on the size of your suppliers. Okay. So how do you manage this? So. When we start the project, we kick off these smaller projects. So for suppliers, you know, we give a, a, a we, we look at your suppliers, and you could look at your suppliers internally, and see how to communicate with them. Because these suppliers, they could be tomorrow, they could be unregistered, they could actually, they could be not meeting the threshold, minimum threshold for registration. They could be just ignorant, small businesses, they have their own issues, and they they will probably not. Some of them will not likely perform themselves well. There are others who will get registered, but they will not organize themselves to raise the correct invoices. The correct invoices that you need for claiming your tax, and then you you may have uh, you know uh, I mean you may have others as well. But broadly speaking. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, you have to identify. You, you have to structure a communication that deals all of these. One communication, and then you can structure a project with the procurement department, giving them the communication in their hand and telling them when will they write this out to all the suppliers, when will they organize the suppliers list. So this is a project that they have to manage. The finance team doesn't have to manage; they just have to oversee. But they have to structure this project very carefully. So, as a consultant, we make sure within one week we have a project from the procurement part. And this project uh, plan will tell us when it's going to write this out, when it's going to set first reminder, when it's going to make a follow-up call, when it's going to report, uh, give a preliminary report to the uh, VAT uh, project team. And then when it's going to give a final report. Through this approach, what will happen is, when you hit 1st January, you will probably have 5 to 10 percent of the suppliers at your door. Because you have communicated with most of them. Through a quality communication, you have created the right expectations. So in this, for example, how, how do you handle this communication? Uh, you could tell them if you're not just going to be registered, that we will not pay you back. Uh, if you're going to be registered and you do not send us a correct invoice, and you could send the format of the invoice to them, which is there uh, available on the on the tax department's website. Although it's incorrect, you know, but yes, uh, it is available. So uh, you will give this format to them, so that they can send you the, the invoice on the, that format. And you tell them if it's going to be, I mean, because of the correctness of the invoice, uh, we, we are disallowed an input claim. Or if the invoice from a is incorrect, we will not pay you the tax. You have a strong position. You are paid in this relationship. So, if you have written a communication and told them that you will deduct tax, uh, you will you will withhold the tax part if the invoice is not correct, 
you can very well do that. And then you can write the standard, you know, if you don't respond to us in say seven days or ten days, we, we, we you know, uh, we, uh, we would believe that you have accepted our, our terms. So again, because you're in a failed situation, you can, you can handle this. Similarly, uh, on the customer side as well, customer side, some of the businesses have bigger issues. Because first of all, customer, I mentioned, the contracts that are going to fall between 1st of June and 31st December, if they don't have the tax clause, you don't have the ability to recover the back from your, ta from your customer. How do you do that? You have to write to them and request an addendum to be signed uh, so that you have this provision. Because some of these contracts could go until five years, until 10 years. I've seen 20 years long contracts and they don't have the tax clause. So you must communicate with, with your uh, customers. Similarly, there are other issues that you may need to address with the customers. And like a lot of a lot of businesses deal with bigger supermarkets. What we are seeing is supermarkets, I'm giving you as, as an example, you could have similar other situations in your business. So these supermarkets generally, I mean if you're a supplier, you send them an invoice and they might be providing you, uh, they might be uh, you know charging you several things like shelf fees. I mean, you have activities, gondolas, blah, 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 you have like, you may end up with six, seven items that they are charging you, but by practice, they are simply setting off this from their real account. How do you handle that? For them to be claiming tax on this, and they will be claiming tax on this, they will be adjusting tax also on the, these fees. But for you to claim the input tax, uh, you know, uh, uh, on this, because you, what you invoiced is, your sale to them, but these are their small sales, seven, six items that I am mentioning. These are their sales to you. So they must raise an invoice on you and they must give you a tax invoice for all of these items. Right now they are not raising those, those, those invoices. And they can continue to set up the way they are right now. So there is no problem with set up. As long as the content gives you the right to set up, they can continue to give you the right to set up. They can continue to set this up. But Getting this, the, I mean, making them raise these invoices hasn't been easy so far. I mean, I know a lot of people are communicating, a lot of people are communicating with supermarkets, and there are other kind of businesses who are communicating with their customers also. And whole business structures need to be changed. You have a situation where somebody like, I mean, a super, large supermarket may need to raise six or seven new invoices on the tax format. And similarly, there are other practices which are not uh, tax compliant. For example, we have seen on our clients, an entity raises an invoice, but the other entity is sending the note. So for example, if there's an entity and uh, it has to issue a credit code because of returns, sometimes we are seeing that the other party issues a debit code. So from a tax perspective, the originator of the invoice uh, uh, you know, can issue the note. The, if the other party issues an opposing note, even with the tax, it will not work. The, the debit or credit notes cannot be original documents from past perspectives. Your invoice is the original documents, debit credit notes have to be adjusting documents. Uh, am I clear on this? Okay. So, I mentioned this, this is a, as a project, the customer's project. One of the large projects, I will go back to my initial uh, initial opinion that large part of the input tax, as is, is not claimable. How do you manage that now? There are two aspects to, to it. One is making sure that most of your input tax is claimable. How do you do that? So we generally set up a, a new project on this. We are generally financed because they administer the petty cash. We simply finance and make a project and try to bring as much as possible the you know the, the petty cash into procurement uh, uh, procurement engine. Okay. So you could identify suppliers for some of the items that are being handled through petty cash. Uh, just to give you an example, for example, you know, I mean you may have distribution vehicles who use who buy petrol from the petrol station. Currently, they come and bring the invoices and you pay them off. 
But this is not going to be, you know, these are not bad invoices. They are never going to be bad invoices if they continue to print like this. So what you do is, you communicate with the, I mean, you have a relationship with a couple of large petrol pump chains and get a corporate relationship with them. And you ask them to issue, uh, give you vouchers and you issue, they issue you a tax invoice. So again, you, you just transform one of your anti cash areas or a non claimable VAT area into a claimable one. Similarly, you could, so this is a large project because you have to work with a lot of your independent expenses. You may have to bring travel into, uh, into uh, I mean, uh, what you call the travel agents, uh, you know, several things. You have to look item by item and then you make sure uh, how you bring them, uh, how you make these uh, VAT, uh, the, the input VATs claimable. The other aspect relating to this is claim of wrong input tax, because that would expose you to penalties. If you are claiming wrong input tax, that exposes you to penalties. And you also have to understand that your audit is not going to happen in the first year. This is probably going to happen in the second or third year. So you could have recurring penalties because you didn't structure yourself correctly, you didn't organize yourself, and you innocently kept claiming a wrong input tax. For example, an international bill which had a VAT from UK, <coughs> because somebody was traveling, somebody just, you know, uh, entered that VAT into the VAT input account and it was claimed quite wrongly. Or you didn't organize your, uh, you know, claimable VAT, like I mentioned, through petty cash or through another structure. And this non-claimable VAT, uh, VAT, which had a wrong invoice, you claimed by mistake. This, if you did in January attorney, in all likelihood you would have done in like, in 12 or 15 or 20 of your returns. And it is fairly easy for the tax, uh, tax officer, even though that this is a recurring mistake. It, it is in all of the returns. So again, we have seen, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we have seen, we have learned from experience of the people that generally speaking, when your audits happen, uh, you have you may have a tax effect of 100,000 dollars reals but you may have penalties of 1 million or 1.5 million because of this recurring nature of the penalties because the audit starts later in the years. In the first year, uh, generally you would have uh, who's filing, who's not filing, uh, you know, or prima facie who's filing incorrectly. So the audit really starts in the later part of the second year, maybe or third year, and by that time, the implications are a lot more because of the recurring nature of the, the, the items. So very important to organize yourself and sometimes because of the size of your business you may see, you may feel that all of the petty cash, if you combine the tax on this, it's not more than 50,000, 50,000 or whatever. You may take a call that we will just ignore this and take this as a hit of the PLM. But the other aspect is knowing which one will be claimable, organizing, because you don't want to be claiming wrong inputs. So, in your chart of accounts, you would create a separate account for non-claimable input. And you make sure that nobody is innocently claiming the uh, uh, wrong input tax. So again, I said, you know, as you, you end up with several projects. You could end up a project uh, with a project on HR side as well, depending upon size, the number of your employees, your business structure, your nature of uh, allowances, and then there are, they can be smaller projects because once you sit with the finance team or finance team sits internally, you identify other areas. Uh, somebody in the contracting business could have I mean, a, a small project for review of the contract. Uh, generally speaking, tax uh, is, is, you know, on, on, the, on the customer side is simple. Earlier of, I mean, the, the point of tax is the earlier of receipt of fund, funds are invoices. <coughs> Uh, but if the invoicing is not contractually defined, then you could go, you, have, you may have to go on the revenue recognition. So again, this can be tricky. This could mean uh, reviewing a lot of contracts. Similarly, if you, are, you, are, you have a business which has large invoices and the revenue is recognized later, this also means that your revenue recognition policies must be correct and your, your system must be configured to do the revenue recognition correctly. And also, you may need 
to make sure that your IFRS compliance, well, because next year is an IFRS compliance year year also. So, again, uh, in, in, in some businesses, you may actually have to do a lot more work on the customer side, within the contract, uh, looking at the revenue recognition, uh, IFRS compliance, uh, because in, in those cases, revenue recognition becomes uh, uh, become important. So just to give you an example, if you if there is a contracting company and get, gets fifty percent of the money in advance, say on thirtieth of October in two thousand seventeen, this project is going to start say in in January. This means all of this advance pertains to a taxable period. And you, when you were paid, this was 2017, and you, you didn't collect the tax. Because you couldn't actually have spoken to the entity to collect tax. But how do you now handle this on 1st of January? 1st of January, uh, depending upon prorata recognition of your revenue, you are having a tax obligation. And an obligation, the tax, the tax underlying this obligation, you actually haven't collected. So your options are, you either pay from your own pocket and maybe collect from, adjust from the client the next payment and uh, when the next payment comes, or uh, raise a separate invoice for uh, claiming tax. Again, whatever course you take will define uh, will be defined by the communication you have have had with them and whether they have agreed to uh, a collection of tax. If if, the, 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 if your customer doesn't agree to the collection of tax, then you don't have any option but to pay the tax from your own pocket. So again, a very important to look at these aspects closely and manage them, and also communicate with your customers and try to agree them on some of the new uh, new things that have happened because of the imposition of the tax. What we have felt is that, generally speaking, if you go to your clients. Uh, and if you try to coordinate with the bad teams, you are able to get some support and often people have been able to sign addendums uh, with, with, their, with their customers. So, just to recap this, you end up with several projects and these are all important projects. If the finance and IT are going to be doing these projects themselves, they don't have that much of a time. You need to be focusing on the system part. You have to make sure you create these projects and let other people do these projects. You give them the tools, you give them the communication tools, you make sure you have a project plan from, the, uh, from them and you make sure that you are just monitoring the project and they are executing the project themselves. Some other kind of implications, I don't know how much of a time do we have now. Okay. So, cash flow implications that I mentioned, you know, uh, depending upon your business structure, uh, your working capital structure more importantly. You could have a negative or positive cash flows ranging from plus 5% to minus 5%. Somebody, uh, an entity who has, uh, you know, sales at a cash counter, most of it, in all likelihood will have a positive cash flow because of the VAT. Somebody who has a poorer, uh, you know, a structure of working capital on the, uh, on the a customer side, on the receivable side, and uh, sorry, uh, 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 and, and you have like shorter periods on the on the payable side, you will have a uh, negative cash flow. Somebody heavily reliant upon uh, imports will have a negative cash flow because you are paying the tax at the port. But now there is no time to be looking at the cash flow side. I mean, you have bigger issues. You don't have time, and you just need to make sure that you are complying uh, with the first entry comes. And yes, if you, I mean, cash flow is very important and you can probably do a broad estimate of what the cash flow would be like rather than going on a, you know, going to a specific detailed cash flow analysis. Uh, contracts I mentioned, uh, VAT communication projects, I just took you through uh, the VAT communication projects in detail. So you can set up these projects and they can be known projects depending on your business structure. Uh, it is important to identify the right communication tools. Uh, one way to look at, I mean, maybe you are already having some communications from your uh, your your clients, your customers, uh, or your suppliers. They may be sending communications, and you can probably look at those and, and just identify what suits best for for your business as communication. 
Uh, Reorganizing non-refundable uh, input tax, I explained this very, very well in detail. Allocation of business versus non-business expenses, yes. Uh, any kind of measure is not, uh, uh, it is not considered business. Uh, like people having dinners, I mean uh, business entertainment expenses, dinners at uh, restaurants, leisure, if, if you know, this kind of travel, not business travel. Uh, Again, sometimes we have, culturally have shareholders' offices in, 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 the, in, the, in, in your uh, head offices. Shareholders who don't have executive roles. All the expenses related to these shareholders are not business expenses, unless they have an executive role. So you may have to identify the premises, uh, the, the premises being used by the shareholder in that scenario. Uh, how much space, what is the electricity, make an allocation, and then uh, identify the amount of input tax that will not be claimed. Procurement <laughs> planning, you know, okay. So, broadly speaking, I've covered everything, uh, 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 you know, that is material, and the most important thing right now, from a compliance perspective, is getting your systems ready, and, a, and an approach that gives you a chance to, getting your, to get your systems ready. Uh, I explain that in detail. So I'll just uh, hand over this to Mr. Ashraf, who can, uh, you know, who can highlight some of the challenges on the IT side and, and dealing with the IT side, and then we'll go to the Q and A. Ashraf. Yeah. Uh, 